Up today, we're going to be speaking with Todd Kaplan, Chief Marketing Officer of Pepsi. Todd was recently named one of Business Insider's top 25 most innovative CMOs in the world. Todd, great to see you. How are you doing today? Doing all right. How, uh, good to see you, too. I was just commiserating uh, about the Super Bowl, and uh, by the uh, time this is this podcast is out, the Super Bowl will probably be old news, but um, it's good to see I'm, I'm on with a fellow sports fan. I uh, would love to hear from you, Todd, about your career journey. You know, you now sit sure. as the CMO of Pepsi. It's one of the most prominent seats in marketing. I know you've spent quite a, a long period of your career at Pepsi. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? PepsiCo is just a great place to work, great company overall, and one of the great things is they really invest in their talent and rotating people across new critical experiences as we call it uh, to try and grow and stretch and learn new things over the years and so I've been here for about 16 years which sounds crazy saying that out loud but that's not and that was not by design to be clear but it uh, it's one of those things you kind of blink and you're like wow um, you know because you keep trying new things I've changed my role every you know two to three years with new things doing everything from running our you know things in our Mountain Dew business starting our energy business um, food service marketing, sports marketing, I mean, you name it, Mountain Dew, across the board, I led our water portfolio uh, for a number of years, creating a couple brands, Bubbly Sparkling Water, Life Water, and then uh, for the last almost five years now, I've been running the, the Pepsi brand, and it's been, uh, it's been a blast, and it's a, it's a really great place to work, so I'm very fortunate. Yeah, and, and we live in the world, Todd, where so many people in the marketing world, it's almost like in the sports world, jumping around from team to team, from company to company every two to three years. And it's definitely more rare to see somebody have the tenure that you've had. What do you attribute that to, and what do you think the benefits are today sitting in the CMOC of having that sort of historical context? I think it's more of a, a nod to the great way that PepsiCo does talent development, is they, you know, and especially for someone like me who, uh, needs to be intellectually stimulated and challenged and you know it's i feel like there's been so, we've such a big broad company right i mean we yeah. represent so many brands in so many different areas and and functions even within the marketing function from innovation to commercial marketing to brand communications creative everything in between i really haven't haven't felt bored at all i've been very excited and stimulated and so i think it's been been great and so i feel like i've i've changed jobs every handful of years just with something new and a new experience where they get you out of your comfort zone which has been great and uh like i said i've been here and what's been great is i've built a lot of great relationships over that time with people in the company and and know uh the way kind of we work internally and all that which has been great as well so it's been a, it's been a great place awesome and i saw the one, the one common thread of your career at pepsi is you've always been in marketing growing up did you always think you wanted to be a marketer and and what kind of <laughs> think led you into that position it's it's a great question and it's uh you know growing up you know i mean like every kid you're know, a baseball player basketball right. player i think of something crazy you know like whatever and then you get a sense of reality and so but no i think is i've always been interested in this idea of uh i remember back in uh, i'm gonna date myself now but back in the the 80s there was this movie secret of my success with michael j fox i don't know if you remember yeah of course running around this all I remember is he's just running around in a suit carrying a briefcase you know going from the mail room to the boardroom a very classic kind of cheesy 80s movie or whatever and i was like oh there's something interesting about business and you know my I, my parents weren't coming from business my dad's a, a pediatrician my mom's a teacher so different professional i said i want to get into business but as i started getting into it i realized that as somebody with a more of a creative disposition and really enjoyed the idea of creativity i discovered the field of marketing and uh just thought it was really interesting and specifically sports marketing is where my background really started uh, when I was in college, you know, I started really getting more exposure to that. I interned at the U.S. Olympic Committee and Fox Sports Net Chicago uh, when I was doing my undergrad at Northwestern and and, uh, and really got my feet wet and learned there's a lot of really fun areas to it and can kind of grew from there. Absolutely. And, and you've been there now at PepsiCo for 16, 17 years. Obviously, the world of marketing has been through such tremendous change yeah. since then, uh, which you've had a front row seat to witness. What are some of the things that stick out to you in terms of how the role of a marketer, especially it's, a CPG company, has changed? It's so funny when you put it kind of bookend to bookend like that. And it's, uh, if I remember like when I first started, and again, I just sound so old saying all this stuff. We came I, out the I, same time, my friend. So it's all, all right, good. good. All right, good. <laughs> I want to make sure, but, uh, you know. When I first started, I remember, uh, you know, I was a young kid kind of starting in this new integrated marketing role that I was between our media and our, our, our media team and our digital team, kind of helping everything from like brand, you know, product placement, brand integrations. That was like a new thought of how you would integrate into media and all that. And at the time, as this like young kid, I remember I was kind of the, uh, 
the web two whisperer internally where it right. was like, you know, YouTube and Facebook and all the kind of stuff, like all that stuff was out there, but it was just, it was really tipping that much more. And I remember I did a whole education session for a whole leadership team uh, at that point, really helping them understand how to use these platforms. Everyone set up a MySpace account, if you can believe that, you know, and we did all sorts of fun things like that. And that, and now fast forwarding to what's changed now, the web three uh, revolution is, is just getting underway. And, I find myself in a similar boat, uh, albeit with a little less hair and grayer hair and all that kind of stuff, but just trying to really um, educate people on, on what it is and, and where that's all going. And when you look at kind of the world that marketing, you know, when I was first starting, there was such a focus on the TV spot and the national yep. campaign and the big the big bet and all that. And there still is a lot of big prominence for that in, a, in the industry that we play in, given top of mind awareness and a lot of the big pushed retailers and stuff we do for our marketing. But um Really, you know, our mix has shifted so much more to digital and so much more to kind of how not just what we tell to consumers, but how we interact with them and engage with them on a deeper level and build kind of that brand love on a two way street is something that I think more and more we've done is we've gotten into more content creation. We've gotten into more, you know, two way platform building and and other things like that that have uh, have really uh, manifested over time. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought up content creation because back in the day, and as I mentioned, we both kind of came out into the marketing world around the same time. It was about advertising, meaning like, what's my unique selling proposition? I I have this sort of interruptive medium called television that I could just cram my message over and over again. But in the world of content, you're starting with the consumer and what their needs are. And then you kind of have to work your way backwards. So I know a big part of what uh, Pepsi does is really focus on content marketing and understanding the consumer. How are you able as as CMO to keep your finger on the pulse of your consumer as it changes so quickly? Yeah, I mean, it's well, there's so many tools now today from social listening to more traditional insights tools and all that. And it really everything we do at Pepsi starts with a, a cultural insight, a consumer insight, and then where those connect with your uh, your product and, and brand truths as well. And that's where all the great ideas come from. But back to just what you're saying about content is, um, you know, historically, there's this point of view that marketing is this very linear kind of hunting and gathering exercise from the brand, exactly. from brand X. I'm targeting consumer Y. I'm going to, like, I use this analogy of throwing my little darts. Once I find them, I'm going to hit them with my message. I'm going to hit you here with my message and here with my, and that just seems super old school and interruptive and just not how it's done, you know, and rather than chasing consumers with your message, rather, why don't you come up with a message that is relevant to your brand, that is relevant to certain areas of culture that, and shine it out and have the consumers come to you. And that is a very different frame around how we've done things like some of the content creation, whether we've created TV shows and series, we've done full length documentaries, we've done prime time, you know, game shows, reality shows, things we've built like just real hardcore content from Pepsi all the way to just digital videos that again have a pass a high pass along value and are just engaging content more than an ad, you know, whether it was the, uh, the trailer we built for the halftime show uh, a couple years ago called The Call that had all of Dr. Dre bringing all the, the halftime performers together all the way to music videos we've made to everything in between. It really comes to why would a consumer want to engage with this content and is it organically something that's interesting to, and relatable to them? And if not, you know, then it's just advertising. And there's a right. role for advertising too, but that, that shouldn't be all of it. That should be just a part of your, your whole mix. Absolutely. And one of the biggest roles for advertising is actually, obviously, during the Super Bowl. I know you recently had a big launch of of Pepsi Zero Sugar that you've been working on. So I'd love to kind of zoom out and talk about what is the product launch like for Pepsi? And what is your role in that product launch? How early are you involved? How are you taking, how are you giving direction from the product development, uh, you know, stage all the way through? I'd love to hear about that process. Sure. So yeah, we do everything. We call it um, AOP. It's our annual operating plan uh, where we come up with each year, you know, what is our big bets for the year for each brand and our whole portfolio? And what are we trying to do? What's our strategic growth, you know, coming from over the three to five years and all that stuff. And so zero sugar obviously is one of the biggest, uh, subcategories that are growing in our space today and an area where we really need to double down. And, um, yep. you know, I'd say a couple of years ago, I mean, we've been focused on this for, for years. Just I trying remember to Pepsi kind of Max it. years ago. Yeah. Pepsi Max, we've launched it for, I mean, it's been out there for years trying to figure it out and get it right. And one of the things we noticed is we had to get our proposition right in terms of the formula 
uh, the product itself. And so very early on, I, I sat with our team and our R&D team as well, and we looked at our product and we said, you know what, this product formula was actually made back from when it was Pepsi Max, back years ago when they launched yeah. it. They launched it with a different caffeine level and a different sweetener blend and a different, and I said, why don't we take another crack? You, you know, it's always a little risky when you want to reformulate a product. You want to make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and have the consumer at the forefront and it's an advantage. Our R&D team did an amazing job and developed a advantage product that we know actually beats the competition on just about every metric, which is amazing. And so we said, let's, let's roll this out in a big way. And so we started rolling it out January this year and it's out in the marketplace now. And uh, we launched it on the Super Bowl with this really uh, compelling proposition, just trying to get people to try it. You know, I don't know if you saw our, our campaign or not. We partnered with um, Steve Martin and Ben Stiller yep. and had a very just different take of the fact that there's this back to this cultural insight around the Super Bowl of everybody is being sold to on steroids on the Super Bowl of like who has the biggest celebrity, who's saying what. And there's this general insight around there's a distrust of advertising they're like well that you just paid that person to say some stuff to me like why should right. i believe that? and what's most important to us is if we want people to try our new formula our new product of course we can tell them as pepsi how great it is we're gonna make well you're pepsi you're saying that and so we thought that was a fun way to kind of push off that leveraging the idea of what's acting and what's real saying you know what everything you're looking at on air you don't know what's real and what's acting the only way to really know is to try it yourself and so we're going to give out uh, 10 million free samples of this new product to uh, us so you can try it for yourself as well. And so that, that was our whole campaign. Yeah, I saw that. Was, I love the fact that you're focusing on sampling. That's where I got my start. And I do believe getting the product in people's hands is ultimately the best way to get them to buy into it. So, but there's a lot in between, Todd, when you launched Pepsi Zero Sugar during the Super Bowl and when your R&D team first comes up with the, you know, the, the mix and the ingredients that I imagine you play a role in in terms of like naming the product, the packaging, you know, oh, yeah, the messaging, like, so are you involved at every step along that product development yes. life cycle? Yes, there's a, there's a whole lot. And this was one that was more of a, a relaunch or, a, you know, of an existing product that, yeah, of course, we got to figure out what's the call out on pack. How do we work with our SRA or science and regulatory people, our legal team or R&D? I mean, there's so many packagings. Retail, you know, merchandising, our customer, all that. Our Walmart folks, getting everyone going along the way, you do that now. You know, going back to where you're saying, you know, when I was um, starting a new brand like Bubbly Sparkling Water uh, years ago on the water team, you know, that's everything from initial inception, insights, naming, packaging, design, product formulation, R&D, legal, you know, all the economics of the cost yeah. of the ingredient. I mean, you get you go to all of that and then what's the marketing plan surrounding it. And so that's probably the most full soup to nuts kind of you can go to is creating a new brand and launching a new brand. In a place like PepsiCo, we obviously have lots of layers, lots of people, lots of stakeholders to involve in those things along the way. Yeah, because often a lot of people just celebrate the launch, but the reality is all the work that, and, and they look at you know your role as very sexy in terms of like you know you, you're at these big events, you're at the Super Bowl, but the the real work I would imagine that you do on a day to day oh basis is the real grind of figuring out some of these 100%. things, right? And that's, that's yeah. The thing. A lot of people, a lot of misnomers of marketing is all we do is the big shiny brand communication, right? media and it's like we do that but we also like you know we have to create the innovation we create the calendar we build the strategy we partner with our consumer insights team we pull them through to the commercial side of our business working with walmart 7-eleven taco bell and food service like you know all the different layers that come into how are you going to grow a business over time and that's what we're really trying to do and the great thing on a brand like pepsi is i remember about five years ago when i came in here you know this business was in a bit of a uh declined for over a decade and yeah. we've now you know had about 15 consecutive quarters of, of straight growth uh since that time positive sales growth our equities up our our business is up we're, we're feeling great so and and you attribute that i guess change in fortunes to innovation and pushing out different products understanding your consumer whole, better there, yeah there's a whole host of things that go into it i'd say uh it really started when we repositioned the brand uh and really starting the to, master brand the master brand of yeah. what we stand for and what do we exist how do we want to show up in the marketplace you know in a bit of a different vibe and energy but then in addition to that having very choiceful and thoughtful plans around when we're focusing on our core when we're bringing in new innovation whether it's around zero sugar whether it's new products like nitro pepsi uh, that bring in incremental users flavors things like that over time and just having the right programming 
um, throughout to keep the brand top of mind, the category growing, uh, as well as the role that we play within. Absolutely. And we're here in 2023, obviously, uncertain macroeconomic environment, not the heyday that we saw as recently as two years ago. How does that change your role as a CMO and how does it impact in the way that Pepsi is going to market this year? Yeah, I mean, you always got to be looking at the macro environment on these things to see um, how to best relate to consumers. And, uh, you know, again, I think today back to you talked about the what are one of the biggest changes over that you yeah. know, year span of my career or whatever with PepsiCo, I'd say is the um, you need to make sure just the different macro environment the context matters more now than ever. Right. Right. If before right. it used to be I could reach everyone through a TV or a radio or an at-home billboard. Now it's in your pocket. It's your freaking phone. It's wherever you are. It's how you're looking at stuff. You can go two ways with it, right? And so, context is critically important for every message to land. And the context of the macro environment, whether there's political strife, whether there's global warming, whether there's an economic, you know, you know, crisis happening, all those things are relevant at different levels to different people uh, for certain things. So obviously. The macroeconomic environment, you know, with as we think about pricing, as we think about the role, people, what they decide to buy and their shopping cart and all that, it, it all definitely factors in. Absolutely. The context matters so much. And a lot, I see a lot of marketers still marketing now, like we're in the year 2021, and it's a Correct. different world. You have to continually totally. evolve. Totally. So you strike me as someone who, you know, through following you in the, through the trades and social media, et cetera, you really understand where marketing is headed and you've never been afraid to kind of grab on to the new things and ways that really are relevant and drive business. There are a bunch of trends that I've been tracking that I know are probably top of mind on your list. And I'm just going to run through a bunch of them with you and see what your thoughts are in terms of where you think things are going. First and foremost is retail media. So obviously you have these big box retailers really pushing these sort of retail media channels to varying degrees of success with, you know, with, with their partners. What is your take on retail media and how important is that as part of your overall media planning? Yeah, obviously it's a, we call it the moment of choice, which is when the consumer's in the store and yeah. looking at kind of the product and where and how they're gonna engage. And obviously there's a lot you can do in those final minutes or of the decision process, at least for our line of business. You know, just to, for context for a lot of the listeners out there, we don't have the same degree of, uh, I'd say lower funnel, you know, possibilities as a lot of direct to consumer brands do where you can sure. drive conversion through, click here and that, you know, if they click on this ad, that's gonna be, 12 times more likely to buy X and Y on the website. Here, our hope is we get you into the store, and then when you get into the store, that we have the right bucket in your brain to get it, we have the right point of sale, the right display activity, pricing, all those things. And so those in-store moments are really important for us, and so that's what this in-store media network says, the stores and our, our customers have more um, you know media that they can uh, engage with. Obviously, it's important for us to participate in, and. Uh, and see how we can drive that final conversion at that moment of choice. And have you generally found those channels to be effective to the extent that you can measure them? Yeah, within differing, I mean, it, it, again, it, right. it all depends on the specific execution, the time, like are you promoting it when your product is out on display and what's the creative, and it, it, it's a full, fully integrated thing that we need to probably talk through a little bit more, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something that customer to customer probably varies. That was very helpful. Let's talk about TV. So I was at CES this year. I already met with Samsung, Roku, Comcast, you know, Google, all these big players that are really reshaping the television industry. And yeah. Pepsi's been a brand that, to your point, although it doesn't solely focus on TV, it's been a big part of its heritage and history. Yeah. As TV becomes more addressable and connected and with the growth of streaming, how does that impact the way that you're looking at TV as a channel and, and some creative executions you might be focused on given this rise of CTV? Yeah, like TV, I mean, TV is mass, right? Every yeah. every home has a, the TV is the centerpiece of your living room. So it's still like culturally our lives revolve around it. You set up your couch so it faces Yeah, it. the form factor couch, of TV is not going anywhere, the right? Form factor, it's it's the screen to get the stuff. Now, what you do once you turn it on is a little different. So rather than maybe scroll through your guide or whatever, you go on demand, you watch Netflix, and what I would say is right now, um, I still don't think the consumer experience is that great when you look at the connected TV. Because right now, I mean, we all go, I went through it this week and we want to watch a movie as a family. You have Who no idea where it is. is. Right. I gotta Google, I got I to gotta check 50 things. It's like, there's got to be a better way until that yeah. universal remote kind of comes to bring it all together, you know, or the, whatever that right solution is. And again, and it's going to all happen and consolidation will happen over time as it is. But what's great about it is there's... Um, 
obviously so many different content that is out there today that we can uh, we can watch and engage with. So there's something out there literally for everyone, but there's also the con of that is there's something out there for everyone is there's so much out there. It's like right. very easy to get lost, to just throw some stuff against the wind and all that. And so I think, you know, I go back to the idea of um, there's two ways you can approach it. Uh, there's the advertising kind of way, which is yes. And some platforms like Hulu and I know Netflix is testing ads and, yeah, you can throw an ad in a pre-roll and it's accepted in here and there. I'm not loving, while there's good reach, I don't love the idea of interrupting someone from what they want right. to see with something. Kind of going backwards in a lot of ways. It's in a little bit ways. going backwards and it's yeah. kind of not the right engagement that you would think. But and then on the flip side, the content itself, you know, like I said, we've created documentaries on Showtime. We've done things where if you can become the content and people are interested in watching it and things like that will be helpful as well. But I think it's an area we're going to keep a keep an eye on you see the whole connected tv thing with um you saw the Tubi spot over uh the Super yep. Bowl, which I that was, was awesome a great, such a great execution that they did and really clever so and there's going to be a lot to come there and we'll see how the tools and uh, as marketers how that all condenses but i think it's going to be less tv specific and more content specific because it's less about the fact that you're watching it through the box in your living room and more about what you're watching yeah yeah, and speaking of content and sort of like the longer tail, I know that Pepsi's also done a lot of work in the influencer and creator space. How do you see that evolving in importance uh, in 2023 for your brands? Well, that's the other thing too, is I think as you look at this, and so as you look at the connected TV, you know, here's an interesting thing is um, I, have, uh, I have two young kids, two two boys, and, and all they watch is these gamers on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, and it's... Um, you know, no matter what's what game is on, no matter what movie we can watch, like I said, you have access to more content at your fingertips on demand than you ever have before, yet a lot of this is coming these kind of bite-sized pieces of YouTube and these creators. And I think um, the creator economy is real where I think, um, you know, the more you can connect in the most authentic ways with some of these people, the more you can figure out what's right for your brand and how to do so, I think it's um, where a lot of the stuff is going. now. Have big brands caught up with how to do that? Have the creators understood how to do it authentically? Absolutely not. <laughs> because right. it's, not um, close. you still see these very forced integrations where it's hard if I'm a creator and someone's offering me millions of dollars to insert their brand, it's hard to say no from an authenticity standpoint because it's real money and they gotta pay their rent and do stuff. And then on the other side, as a brand, you don't wanna completely you know, give the guardrails and say, hey, do what you will, say what you will, be authentic. Right. A lot of brands get very heavy handed and say, must say it this way, and then it doesn't feel right. And so the balance in that is finding the right partners, the right creators, having the right authenticity, giving them the full degrees of control since they know their audience in the right ways to do it in their way. And then partnering, you know, being more choiceful with who and how you partner. Yeah, and being able to execute at scale, right? Because, you know, you guys are a global brand and you need to be Correct. able to execute everywhere. So how do you do that in a very scalable way that, you know, is driving business results? It's real tricky. It's real tricky. So I think, yep. there, again, that's another area that I'd say to watch that's going to evolve over time as uh, tools and, and how to engage comes a little bit easier. And the last piece that is obviously something that every market is talking about right now is the role of, of these AI tools. You know, and here in 2023, it's just incredible how much momentum they've gotten, at oh. least in the trades, at least from buzzwords. Do you see applicability with those tools to your business in the near term, or do you think it's something a little bit further I mean, out? Yes, yes and no. I think there's a good role for AI as you look at a lot of that lower funnel stuff, optimizing digital unit, And we already do a lot of that stuff where it's like, Hey, you throw up a couple units, which one does better? Da, da, da. Like that stuff all day, every day, easy. Right. I think if you get into the creative element of it of saying, hey, you know, just for fun as chat GBT has come out and all that stuff, you know, you could say, you know, I'm sure you've played a lot around with it just like most sure. people have. And you can, I mean, you could say, hey, write me a Super Bowl ad for Pepsi. And it actually does. Or you could say, hey, tell me how to... What should I do? You know, next month, like it, it's it's really an amazingly phenomenal tool and uh, scarily smart how it works and how a lot of that stuff happens. That being said, I don't think there's any need for replacing the role of agencies or the role of, that people will play moving forward with it. <clears throat> I do think there are probably some helpful um, shortcut kind of moments as in as far as a creative process, right? So Augmentation. If I'm trying to brainstorm like, hey, what do I want to name? What are some fun names for this product? What are some scenarios I could like you could potentially use tools and things like that to help inform? Yeah, but I'd say where it is right now. It's definitely a space to watch. But um, 
I think it's getting a lot of press and a lot of discussion right now because it's so, you know, game changing in how smart the technology is. But I don't I don't think right now today uh, it's going to replace anything in the process. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it is reminiscent a lot of like, you know, the blockchain entering 2021 where everybody was talking about it. And then, you know. It kind of it, there was a boom, and then the the price of crypto dropped, and then Correct. everyone sort of went away, except for the people who were doing the real work. And I think Correct. one day, two or three years from now, brands are going to have these applications which make sense for the consumer. And right. everyone's like, "Why didn't I do that all along?" And I think that's generally what happens: is the okay. media stops paying attention as soon as the real work begins. It's, it's the same thing. Like right now, it's a bit of a of a novelty. It's like when a, when Alexa and all that starts. Exactly. Right? It's like it's like a bit of a novelty, like. Look, it hears my voice, and like people put them in their house, and their kids just ask it to play stupid songs all day. Right, it's like it's, you know, the amount of people who connect it to every single element. And there are people, of course, who are the early adopters who make it turn on their lights and their car. And they, I get all that, but at the end of the day, just because the technology is there, I think is the big headline. But then when it adopts to the masses. I think that's still going to be uh, a handful of years away before we really embrace the the true benefit of a lot of these things, like the blockchain. I agree, hundred percent. I heard a Steve Jobs, you know, clip the other day where he's talking about we don't want to take great technology and figure out how to get consumers to use it. We want to understand what consumers' needs are and figure out if we have the technology to deliver on it. That's right. And I think a lot of companies okay. are trying to, at least in the last couple of years, take some of these innovative new technologies and cram it down consumers' general behaviors, and that's just not how it works. They're not going to change your behaviors like that. Correct, correct. I don't think yep. you can chase these things with the uh, what I call shiny penny syndrome. So yeah, absolutely. So as we wrap up here, Todd, uh, just you know, let's zoom out to you and, and your role. You're obviously sure. um, it, have an incredible role and one that many people in the marketing and advertising industry are undoubtedly just fascinated with in terms of what does your day to day look like? So <laughs> what is the pie chart of a day of Todd Kaplan? Oh, is it the same every day? Does it change? Tell us a little bit about about that. Every day is different. I spend a lot of time with my team talking through uh, you know, our plans. And a lot depends on the, the time of year you're talking about also. Right. So we have like the AOP planning for their annual plan when we're ramping up for next year's plans. There's sometimes when we're just launching, like Super Bowl, we've been neck deep doing all the stuff for Super Bowl. And right now our summer programming that we're working on and stuff from the fall, we have some really, really big stuff planned for the back half of the year. And so... But like I said, it just really depends on, on the day that there are sometimes we do everything from a product tasting all the way to, uh, you know, a, a brief or we're reviewing creative to, you know, we're going through our scorecard and our performance operating review and just looking at how the business is doing and what's working, what's not. And so it's, it's really a, a full, full boat of uh, the full marketing experience that we get to do here, which is great. Gotcha. Awesome. And, and, and if you were to give one piece of advice to somebody to end up in your seat one day in the CMO seat, what, what would that be? What, what path did you take do you think was most helpful in the line? I don't it, think there's a, I don't think there's a specific path or anything. And I, I said, I don't think I've been on even any path. I think it's more of a matter of just, um, and I've said this to people giving career advice as well. It's that, uh, you make the role, the role doesn't make you, uh, like is kind of this concept. And it's one of those things that a lot of people look at a job description on paper when they're starting a new thing. And by concept, whenever you start a new role, there's usually a boss and there's maybe a predecessor who did the role before you a certain way. And so when you get in there, there's already a bit level of bias as to like, the boss sees the role as X and Y and you need to look at it this way and here's your core objectives, which you have to of course listen to, they're your boss and you need to deliver those objectives. The person before you may have done great or may have done okay with it. It depends on you know what the context is in leaving and said, hey, this is what they thought was important or this is where they were focused on, keep doing this, don't do that. But you're going to lose sight of some of those horizontal kind of beyond the kind of tunnel vision of that focus of the role. Like, of course, once you get that focus kind of really going, you might be able to see other opportunities right. that lie, you know, to this. Where you can take virtual. initiative and actually make Where your you work in a different initiative. way. So yep. I've always found, even when I was very junior, starting from my very first role in that branded entertainment, branded content thing, I told you that digital immersion I led, that was not something that was asked of me. That was something I provocatively did there. Each role as you take it, you can kind of create opportunity and say, hey. It's fantastic advice. I'm sitting in this little seat right here, and I get that they've defined it as this, but if I can see where the organization needs something that could relate to this, maybe I can add on this area or bring in this area to really 
you know, proactively um, drive some new thinking and bring some new enterprising. Right. Because when you're getting reviewed, no one's going to go back to the initial job description and say, yep, you did that. You did that. You did that. Great. We're going to promote you. That's not right. generally how it works in this competitive right. environment. Right. Well, it, it does mean you do need to still deliver your core account. Check the box. Sure. Ignore what your boss needs or anything. That's not the context either. Right. You have to do what you need to do. But once you can kind of get that going and figure out kind of how to do your day job, how do you kind of figure out? Are there other areas that, as I look at the broader organization and the role that I sit, that this role can help better serve the organization and maybe I can help my boss see things that they're not seeing or help my peers in another group see what they're... So that's part of it is just whatever role you're in. You know, I've been in roles that people say, oh, I wouldn't want that role. or Oh, why do you want to go work over there? And then you see the opportunity and you build it into something cooler than when you started. So that's... uh, that's the opportunity to say every role I've been in, I've, I've taken that perspective and uh, so far seems to be going okay. Awesome. And finally, Ty, with that, is there one quote or mantra that you like to live by that sort of drives it? You've mentioned a couple throughout this, but does something come to mind? Oh my goodness, there's so many. I wouldn't say there's one. One thing I've said quite a bit with my team internally is I say take no as a request for more information. Right. Uh, because a lot of times we hear a lot of no's from our internal stakeholders and trying to push things around and trying to kind of be agile and, and flex with it. The other one I'd say is probably this idea of, um, there's another just more career advice, I would say. And this is, it gets back to this concept of going big or going home kind of thing of, um, you know, I say, um, write your resume in reverse. And by that I mean is when you start a new role, say, hey, here's the three or four things I want to make sure we did in this role. I grew the brand from X to Y, I launched this thing, I did this whatever, and then put that up you know, on your, your wall, on your screen and whatever, and just make sure you spend like 70 something percent of your time on those things and uh, focus on the big things rather than all the little things. And that's where um, the real impact can be felt. You know, when you go back and you talk to someone like me or other people, you talked about their career stories, they tell you every freaking meeting they had and every, you know, thing they've done, they tell you the big things. Hey, I did this. I launched this. I did that. So, Try when you're starting a new role to think about what are those things three plus years from now you want to say you did in this role and damn, focus your time. Yeah, they talk about the they talk about like things that are important or urgent, and I think a lot of times people jump towards what's urgent, which is sort of like the fire of the day, right? But the things that are important would be the thing on that. Totally, it's a time management thing. And listen, I get sucked into the urgent thing just like anybody else does, and internal stuff. And but you you got to just try to gut check yourself and every so often to say, hey, are these the things I really want to do here? Is this what am I doing? Am I a victim of someone else's calendar? Am I doing what I want to really achieve out of this job? So I think- Awesome. Well, thanks so much. We're going to leave it with that, Todd. Um, On behalf of Susie and the IWE team, thanks again to Todd Kaplan, CMO of Pepsi, for joining us. It was an amazing interview. I can't wait for our audience to hear it. Uh, Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, we'll see you soon, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. 